Hello, this video is about the second fundamental theorem of calculus. My name is Mr. Salminga. So previously we studied the fundamental theorem of calculus, and this is technically the reverse of it. That formula that we've been working on the last two weeks, it was always the integral of the derivative equal to function. Second fundamental theorem of calculus is very similar. If I take the derivative of an antiderivative of some constant c to some variable x of f of t, so you'll notice that these two variables are different, I will get f of x. There is a way to prove it. Um, I guess I don't, uh, I mean, I could show you the proof. I could show you the proof in class. But um, relevant to this video, um, just assume that this formula is true. To make it even easier for you, what it means is that if you take a derivative of an antiderivative where there's a constant x, all I have to do is plug in x, even though the variables don't match. Okay. So for example, it says find f prime of x. So here it says f of x equals negative 1 to x of some function. And it says take the derivative of it, or essentially take the derivative of this, right? If this is x, it says take or find f of prime, or f prime. So if it says take the derivative of this, I have to first see if it qualifies under the second fundamental theorem of calculus. So do you see I have a constant here? And do you see I have an x here? So the answer, and all I have to do, is plug in x. Sorry, that's supposed to be x to the third minus x. So all I have to do to find f prime is plug in x everywhere you see t. Pretty simple. This one's a little bit different. So you'll notice that it says take the derivative of this, or take the derivative of the antiderivative. One problem, though. It doesn't have a constant here, and it doesn't have the x here. So before I even start, I need to rearrange it. Remember that um, <clears throat> remember that to convert this or to change the bounds, I need to flip it and make it negative. And again, sorry about my messy handwriting. So now do you see that this qualifies under the second fundamental of theorem calculus? I have, have a constant at the bottom, a variable at the top. So now that if I want to take the derivative, all I got to do is plug in x. So there's a negative out in front, then cosine to the fifth of x. So some of you will like this, some of you will find it very easy, um, and it is. Okay. Now there's two things that are the problem with these ones. Okay. So let's look at these next two examples. You'll notice that when I take the derivative of the antiderivative, it does qualify under the second fundamental of theorem of calculus, but you'll notice that I do have a constant at the bottom, but I don't have x at the top. How does that change? Well, since I'm taking the derivative, remember chain rule, where I have to take the derivative of the outside times the derivative of the inside? So what I have to do first is I'll plug in the 2x. So instead of t to the third, it'll be sine 2x the third, multiplied by the derivative of whatever is in this um, in this bound. So here it's 2x. You know, normally when it's x, technically I'm doing the chain rule, but the derivative of x is just 1. But in this case, the derivative of 2x is 2. So simplifying everything, my answer is going to be 2 sine, and then I have to simplify this 2x to the third power. 2 to the third power is 8, and then x to the third power is x to the third power. That's how you do chain rule for uh, second fundamental theorem of calculus. So that's what f of prime is equal to. Last one, you can see that I'm combining the two things. First of all, I have my constant here. So you know what to do to make the constant on the bottom, right? I'm going to basically pull out a negative. And I'll make this 3 to the x squared. Cube root of 8t plus t to the fourth. And now, I can just plug in x squared everywhere I see t, and then multiply by the derivative of x squared. So I have still the negative out in front. I have the cube root of 8x squared. And then you know that x squared to the fourth power is going to be x to the 8. And then I multiply by the derivative of that bound. Remember, this is x squared, so I have to multiply by 2x. Your answer is negative 2x 
the cube root, or sorry, the square roots, oh, no, the cube root of 8x squared plus x to the 8 power. And the last one, just like we did for the first fundamental theorem calculus, you need to know how to do this on a graph. Okay. So here we go. It says here's a graph. Find the the following ones. I got g, regular g. I got g prime. I got g double prime. Okay. So first, let's tackle these regular g functions. So the CS says g to the negative four. So that means in this problem, see it says g of x equals this. So everywhere I see x, I have to plug in negative four. So g to the negative four. Again, using this formula means plug in negative 4 everywhere you see x. So this now becomes 1 to the negative 4 f of t dt. Now, just like in yesterday's classwork, some of you were wondering, you know, how do I do this without an equation? How do I take the antiderivative? Remember, they give me a graph. So they want me to find the antiderivative from 1 to negative 4. So here's 1 to negative 4. And you'll notice that it's backwards. Um, I'm going 1 to negative 4. So you'll notice that for me to do this correctly or to find the area, what I'm going to do is I'm going to flip it and make it negative. So do you see now how it's going in the right direction? So now what i got to do is find the area from negative 4 to 1. First of all, you know that it's, um, you know, it's underneath the x-axis, so this is going to be negative. So the shape that I have here from negative 4 to 1, you see it's a trapezoid. I have a base that is 4 long, and I have a base that's 5 long. And my height is negative 2. So the area of this trapezoid is going to be 9 over 2, adding the bases, times the height, which is negative 2. This, this cross cancels. I'm going to get negative 9. So negative, negative 9, g to negative 4 is 9. Okay. g to the 1, again, I plug in 1 into this upper bound because that's where I put x. And essentially, I get an integral from 1 to 1. And this was one of the fundamental rules of integrals. If I'm integrating from a number to the same number, it always equals 0. Which makes sense, because how can there be an area under the curve if I'm starting and ending at the same spot? So that equals 0. 3, so same thing, it's like 1 to 3. Notice that the bounds are already set from 1 to 3. So I need to find the area from 1 to 3. I'll use a different color. You'll notice that from 1 to 3, oops. You'll notice that from 1 to 3, I have a triangle. I have a height of 4. I have a base of 2. Half base times height is half 2 times 4, or half of 8 or 4. Then g to 8, or g of 8, means I need to take the integral from 1 to 8. And from 1 to 8, I already have 1 to 3, which is a, uh, which is this triangle. Remember we told you it was 4. But now i got to figure out all the way through here. You'll notice that I have, again, a weird circle thing, and i got this triangle here. So first let's measure this triangle. This triangle is has a base of 1, it has a height of 4. Half the base times height is going to be 2. Right? Base times height is 4, half of it is 2. And now this little piece, I'm not too sure what to do. Okay? Remember I told you how to deal with this little circle stuff? First of all, think of it as a big rectangle subtracting this half circle. Okay? This whole rectangle is 4 across and 4 high. So the whole rectangle is technically 16. But I'm subtracting this circle. So this circle is the area, or I'll use area of a circle, pi r squared, but only half of it, right? I'm only taking half of a circle, so I'll do half pi r squared. This radius, you'll notice, like from the center to the outside is 2. So it's going to be half of pi 2 squared. Or this becomes 4. 4 over 2 is 2, or this whole thing becomes 2 pi. So the area of this, oops, the area of this little weird shape is 16 minus 2 pi. So if I want the area from 1 to 8, it's going to be 4 plus 2 plus 16 minus 2 pi, or 22 minus 2 pi.
Now here comes the tricky part. How do I do these primes and, and double primes? Okay. Well, if I want g prime, okay, I need to derive the g prime formula because they gave us the g formula, and all I have to do is plug it into x. But I don't have a g prime formula. The g prime formula, if I plug it in, remember g prime is equal to um, just plugging in x. So if I take g prime, or if I take the derivatives and antiderivative, remember all I do is plug in x here. So remember, all I have to do is plug in x into the formula. So if I want g prime, g prime is the same thing as f of x. So if I want g prime of 0, that means the exact same thing as regular f of 0. And you'll notice that f of 0 at this point is negative 2. So remember, g prime is the exact same thing as f of x, or what is the value at 0? If you get that, let's look at this, g prime 5, which means what is the value at 5 for f? Right? g prime is the same thing as just f of x. So if I plug in 5, I'm going to get 2. Okay. g double prime, you might be a little bit confused, means take the derivative at that point. So do you see at 5, my derivative or my slope at 5 is 0? Okay. So g double prime of 5, which is the same thing as f single prime of 5, or which means the same thing as a derivative at 5, I got a slope of 0 at 5. Then the last one, g double prime of 1, so I need the slope at 1. You'll see at 1 I have this regular slope right here. It's positive, but I don't know what it is. So I'll have to use the slope formula. I'm going to use these two points. I'm going to use 4 comma 3. Here, I'll type it out. I'll use, sorry, 3 comma 4. And um, to make it easy, I'll do 1 comma 0, because the slope is the same everywhere. So here are my two points. Okay. I'll do the slope formula. So it's going to be 4 minus 0 over 3 minus 1. 4 minus 0, 3 minus 1, which gives me 4 over 2, or 2. So what I found is that the slope at 1 is 2, which also means the same thing as g double prime of 1. So just to repeat, if I have a regular g function, I take these numbers right here and plug them in up here. If I have a g prime, which means I have to take the derivative of the antiderivative, means just plug in x. So g prime of 0 just means f of 0. g prime of 5 just means f of 5. And if I have g double prime of 5, that means just the same thing as f prime of 5. Or g double prime 1 means f prime 1. So that is the second fundamental theorem of calculus. Of course, we'll practice in class. Thank you for watching, and I'll see you all later.